Welcome back to the Wolf of Queen Street podcast. Today on the episode, Tox Fale, a former professional rugby player and now turned pro wrestler for New Japan Pro Wrestling, an entrepreneur, a motivator, and someone that is trying to change the world and is bigger than life. And just every time I go on social media uh, over the last three or four years, I see his content. And it's crazy that he did a video about... In COVID 2020, uh, you might tell me um, more close to the date, but asking dads and fathers how they are doing. I just recently reposted it myself, and that video made me want to speak to him, learn more about him. And then, crazy enough, a few years later, he's sitting here on the table. We can discuss your life and what you're doing and how you're trying to change the world. And uh, and it's very few times that I sit at this table being my size that I feel like I'm a very, very small human being. Talk, so uh, <laughs> welcome to the show. Thanks, Lawrence. Good to be here. Oh, man. Awesome. So, you know, you are a professional um, pro wrestler for New Japan. It's something that's really interesting, and that's uh, the, the the wrestling world, right? So um, whether you're in it or not in it, everyone in the world knows, you know, WWE or WWF in those days. Um, and you either love it, you're in it, or you way out of it and think it's crap and you think it's, you know, bullshit and it's fake and all the rest of it. So... Before we get on to that side um, of the stuff, how'd you, how did you get yourself into that world? Oh, man. I, I went to Japan to play rugby, mm -hmm. right? and uh, I fell in love with the country. And when I finished from rugby, I wanted to stick around in Japan. So a friend of mine said there was a tryout, so I went and tried out and got in, and that's how I ended up in wrestling. Is it something you thought you'd get yourself into? No, you know, most kids dream of becoming a wrestler, but, uh, you know, growing up in New Zealand, there's no opportunities. Back back then, there was none. Yeah. And, you know, that dream just disappeared. But, you know, when I finished from rugby and the opportunity was there, you know, I started thinking maybe I can become a, a wrestler. So that's how it all began. So, and getting into it, you know, there's. I know you've spoken about this before on, on on previous shows and times. Like, there's different, there's different cultures from different organisations and different expectations, right? I know with New Japan, um, they've got a they got a main focus on fundamentals before you performing, right? So you've got to learn everything compared to someone like a feed assistant that could be under the WWE that just wants you to perform before under learning the fundamentals. Yes. So you might not see as clinical wrestling compared to new japan yes. uh talk me through how like the new japan program uh, does that to teach you those fundamentals i have found that the difference between all of them and japan is japan will teach you to be a real fighter first mm -hmm. because to them it's it's real mm -hmm. uh and uh if you don't know how to protect yourself then uh, you, you won't be able to debut over mm -hmm. there so when i started there it's you had to learn how to box. You had to learn how to kickbox mm -hmm. and grapple before they even teach you how to do a lockup. So it's real. And if you're ever in the trouble in the ring or outside of the ring, as a wrestler, you can say, I'm a wrestler and I can kick your ass. <laughs> <laughs> Where, you know, a lot of a lot of uh, wrestlers from abroad or, um, you know, f from abroad would know how to wrestle as a performer, but when they get into altercations in the ring or outside of the ring, yeah. it's a different story. Because a lot of that, yeah, because a lot of it's a lot of that's pushed towards um, the, um, theatrics or theatre towards yes. it. No disrespect, I fully respect no the sport and I, no. and I love it. Uh, I was just talking to Tox um, offline. My, my son's getting into it now, mm. as um, and in a couple of years, once I start training, so I'm living it <laughs> every day. And it's I I got him into about a, a year or two years ago. Um, Guy, we come to your first show. Yeah, when was it? The first show I brought him to to see you. Uh, when you lost your hair, when you had hair, you, yeah, he had a. Um, we so, had hair. Yeah, so, yeah. So, guy had a um, behind the camera is also a, a pro wrestler here in for IPW and use and most of the news and organisations. You had a mullet versus Mohawk fight, <laughs> and you lost it and lost your mullet, right? Yeah, that's right. So it was awesome, and that's what I got my son into it, and <laughs> and loves it now. And um, it's such an interesting one because I know in a lot of the different organisations, like yourself, like you've got your, you've got um, the Fale Dojo, that's a New Japan New Zealand dojo, right? Yes. One of the coolest things as a father, I or as a 
farther now, but as I grew up in the 90s, I grew up watching WWE and WWF when it was that stage and seeing these superstars and amazing. We just talked about off, uh, off air about I saw Yokozuna in 1996 in South Africa and how amazing it was to me. Now, there's still the circuit here in New Zealand and, you know, you're over in Japan. Is, uh, America's just as massive. But my boy is now able to grow up and actually watch the local scene. Now, the local scene's great. I, I wish it was bigger and, and it's building up. You know, you got your, your own wrestlers and performing. I think you said you got an event tomorrow when we were recording this and you got a couple of guys coming on Sunday. Um, my son is growing up to see his heroes. Um, you know, so we go to events and th- this is super cool compared to in the 90s. All I had was watching on TV. I didn't have the, the local circuits. Now, um, some growth needs to happen in the rest of it, but it's still cool for teens and boys to come along or girls. I've got, uh, I've got friends that I've brought over, like 20 or 30 of us at an event and we've got the girls screaming and the boys shouting. And <laughs> my daughter, I remember the one, we went to one event and my daughter's like, kick him in the nuts. And <laughs> she loves violence. And she was going off crazy because oh. this is the, this is the one space as a 15 year old, she was allowed to shout and she was allowed to say like, can I hit him in the nuts or <laughs> rip his head off? Cause at home you can't speak like that. That's right. right. <laughs> um, and that's just something cool that I'm finding about um, this community as I'm getting more and more into it, which is yeah. um, which is cool. And I'm hoping that it keeps the buzz going around. What what we, what you guys are doing, both both of you in the room, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Growing up in the '90s, I was a fan just like you. Yeah, but I had no idea or there was none mm-hmm. at the time. I would have loved to go along to a live show. Yeah, man, that would have. I would have gone straight into wrestling if I had, if it had, if we had that back then, mm-hmm. you know, but, uh, you know, unfortunately we didn't, but I'm so happy now that so many options out there yep. and uh, the different styles, you know, there's a lot of different schools here. They cater to different types of, uh, wrestlers and it's a good thing, mm-hmm. you know, um, for, for sure. I come from Japan and I bring the Japanese style. Mm-hmm. And I can teach that style, but I can't teach some of the other styles. So yeah. having different schools is is pretty good. Yeah. So obviously, people have the big say about you know uh, um, you know pro wrestling scripted, fake. It doesn't count. I can tell you, I've been at some of the local events, and the boys were walking off. I was at an event at the Use Academy three weeks ago, and the guy broke his finger. Oh, that's when I met you. One yeah. of the um, the main events. He walked away, broke his finger in the main event. One of the guys I, I saw his back from what I'm going to say this wrong, like got slapped on the back, double handed, and his back was just all red and stuff. I can tell you, it's not all fake and it's not all soft, but there is obviously some mechanism and some storylines and some practice in the rest of it. Talk me through what the actual is in the wrestling scene, which is a little bit you know behind the curtains, um, but also that not all of it is fake. You're still getting hit. You're still getting thrown. I know with New Japan, you guys aren't as, say, flamboyant as you would get in the WWE, but there is still a lot of that stuff. Yeah, the um, saying, uh, don't do this at home because it takes years of practice, Mm -hmm. that's so true. Uh, And not because it it takes years to to learn how to do a move. It takes years to learn how to be safe. And I've seen a lot of people get hurt in the ring, a lot of people get paralyzed in the ring mm-hmm. and a couple die in the ring. So when people say it's fake, you know, that's that's coming from people who have, haven't been to a live show yeah. or haven't, you know, really looked into what it really is. Uh, and it's entertainment for sure, mm-hmm. but um, it's live entertainment. Uh, you see things like movies, mm-hmm. right? And you, you pretty much... No, it's entertainment, yeah. but a lot of people on those movies are risking their lives to do these stunts and all that stuff. It's the same thing, you know, but they, you're just watching it live. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's awesome. Now, I, I know you've spoken about it before. You just said like a, a couple of people, you know, die in it. People don't realize how across the world with the sport, how many major injuries or deaths that actually happen across that because of people trying stuff, don't have the skills and something happens, right? Yeah. Yeah, they don't. And a lot of times when people ask me, I tell them this is the most dangerous sport in the world mm-hmm. because we have more people dying in it than any other sport. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. 
Because <laughs> I, I mean, you can imagine from, you know, guys on the top rope or guys doing, uh, you know, or the rest of a suplex or an old school, um, you know, the old school DDTs and Undertaker did the Tombstone and all that stuff, right? Yes. Um, on the head, on the neck, on the shoulders, just if it didn't land right. Mm. Um, you know, we just spoke about some stuff that's happening in AEW in the last few weeks where one of the greatest wrestlers just got knocked out cold in the ring from a mistake, yeah. right? Yes. Um, and, 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 it, and they've been experienced for 30 years and it still yes, happens. that's true. It happens. You know, you never know. Sometimes when I, the times I get hurt mm -hmm. is when we have uh, easy matches. Yeah. You know, because you let your guard down. Damn. Um. And then you think, oh, it's going to be easy. And then all of a sudden, you hurt, you hurt yourself. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's it. Even pros get hurt. Yeah, it does happen. Um, I know with the with the wrestling world, there's this whole body image thing, right? We went through um, um, New Japan might be a little bit different. WWE, obviously, is you know you got to look you got to look the part. You either got to be like ten foot tall, or you got to be like jacked, like there's no tomorrow, <laughs> right? I remember through. There was a period, it was a, like early 2000s where every guy looked like he was on juice and it was just, you know, Triple H had like, yeah. my, like my dad would say, he had muscles on his eyeballs at one stage. He was just um, so big and the rest of it. Is there, you know, from from your side of it, and uh, uh, talk me through the, the New Japan scene, is that part of the expectation there as well to have this, this drive towards his body image or is it more um, drive towards what is done in the ring? Because obviously on the WWE side, we can see that it's like pretty humans, jacked, chiseled, mm -hmm. unless you a very, very, you know, big guy, like someone like the big show and stuff like that, you, you, you're not having to worry about cutting that all down. Uh, if you watch some of the Japanese wrestlers or the guys who wrestle in Japan, uh, you'll notice that most of them are just big. Mm -hmm. You know, you'll find a couple of them with just big shoulders and abs, yeah. uh, arms, whatever. But most of them kind of look like me, <laughs> you know, and that's because they don't uh, focus on what, what you look like. Uh, I, you know, not downing the American wrestlers, but to me, if you can't or you don't understand how to wrestle, you, you you win them over of how you look. Yeah. And a lot of jobs and a lot of careers, that's how you do it. Mm -hmm. you know, if you can't do the, the work, win them with your looks, <laughs> <laughs> so to speak. Yeah. But uh, in Japan, you have to do all of it. Yeah. Uh, looking the part is just a part of it. But if you don't know how to, how to talk, if you don't know how to wrestle, mm -hmm. you have to do all of it. Uh, some places, if you know how to talk and don't look the part, that's okay. If you look the part, don't know how to talk, that's still okay. Mm. And Japan is all around, so mm. most guys, big guys, uh, look like me, <laughs> and the smaller guys, they they're more just quick and agile. But yeah. the look is not as important. Man, if there's a lot of them that look like you, fuck it. I'm not going over to <laughs> Japan, man, because that's, uh, that's some well, that's actually, some big humans, actually man. Actually, a lot of, man, I don't know if you ever met a sumo wrestler, <laughs> but uh, they're bigger than I am. They <laughs> double my size, so. And they yeah. can move. Oh, man, they can all do the splits. Yeah. Check it on YouTube. <laughs> they got videos of all the sumo wrestlers that have to do the splits. Okay, I've got to explain it to my family if they're walking <laughs> and I'm watching sumo wrestlers doing the splits at home, right? And they're like, what are you fucking watching? What shit is that? Study purposes. <laughs> yeah, study <laughs> purposes. The research, right? Um, yeah, so t with the, with the, talking about the, the body culture and all the rest of it, so obviously there's a lot of people understanding that there's a lot of um, steroid use in the American side of it to get like at. Sorry, mm -hmm. uh, guys out there, you cannot physically naturally look like that. It's just not a mm -hmm. given. But then you also got the other side of the coin of that. You've got guys that are going through injuries, like we say as well, yes. and then uh, medication and then drug use and then addiction. So I know that there's underlying um, – there's this almost hidden taboo that the public doesn't realize that of how much – drugs is actually flowing through the wrestling scene not necessarily a local scene don't get me wrong there mm -hmm. but the professional scene there is this underlying taboo world that to wrestlers you'll know about it but the public might not know that there's actually almost an issue going on there i, I feel like uh, the only issue with it is mostly in the states mm -hmm. or western country western cultures cultures i mm -hmm. mean 
Uh, where in Japan, it's nobody cares. Yeah. Because they know how to use it properly. Mm-hmm. And there's no laws against it. So, the, you know, if they abuse that, then they, you could you could tell. Yeah. But just by the way they look. But uh, most of them don't use it because naturally mm-hmm. you can get big. Yeah. Um, I remember I asked uh, one of my uh, um, mentors one time if I needed to do it. And I've never done it before. Yeah. And I asked him, should I do it? And he said to me, why? You're already big. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then I said, okay, that's good. I yeah. don't need it. If I don't need to do it, if I can make money the way I look, I'll just stay the way I am. Um, but uh, even other sports, when I played rugby, um, there were there were steroids that were legal to use. Mm. you know, And everybody just puts it into one what do you call one big uh what bracket. Do you call it? yeah to one bracket and yeah. say steroids are bad steroids are mm-hmm. bad where most people don't un- understand there's some steroids are used for certain injuries mm-hmm. and and there's other steroids that help you get big or help you get small yeah it just gets all rounded into one which gives it that stigma that steroids is bad but um you know, I I got nothing against it. The only place to ban it is over in America. Do they ban it here in the? Yes, uh, and New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> but yes. uh, yeah, a lot of some people, if you're not taught the right way to use them, correct, which is by the doctors. <laughs> yeah, um, then certain people get too much into it, and that's when addiction and effects on on their bodies. <clears throat> uh, yeah, well, it's true. Like uh, many, many, many years ago, when I was a lot smaller, I was in the um, in my late twenties. I was in the bodybuilding scene, so that's obviously a scene that's driven by. Mm. But I was natural, so that's one thing. I never, but I got offered as I as I, I joke, I, I called orange juice. So I was got I got offered orange juice um, the whole time, and all, and then learning about it and all the rest of it. And where a lot of people don't realize is, yes, it gives you this benefit, but by consuming it, your body do, therefore doesn't produce it. So over time of overuse, you don't have it. So yes. that's where people don't realize the likes like Arnie and Sylvester Stallone and those guys that oh, abused it 40 years ago, they've still got to take it taken now. Otherwise, their body would just, their muscle uh, fatigue or because deteriorate. It needs it. Yeah, yeah it your body needs it, it because you, if you give, if you take medication that your body naturally produces mm-hmm. uh, and too much, your body goes, well, you're getting it here. I'm not going to make it anymore. So I'm just going to shut your system down. Um, and that's also like when people have um, one of the big ones that people have is um, sleeping tablets. So uh, again, that's where people um, have issues of sleeping. So there's a herb, there's something called melatonin, yes. which is the natural hormone your body produces that allows you to sleep. So you can actually buy tablets of melatonin, which will help you sleep. But then people take it all the time, and by taking it, your body goes okay. And then as soon as you come off the tablet, you can never naturally fall asleep, and that's why. And that's how that that's time. how that circle goes, yes, starts, right? And yes. just as it could be a herbal tablet, it could be anything else, but it's a weird way yes. how your body reacts to it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I know with a big thing with your with your career and everything else, and I know a big underlying stuff is talk me through uh, and the thought patterns. I know something that's big about you is understanding and learning from failure and having that as part of your you know your base and the rest of it. Talk me through that that thought pattern. Uh, that's something I learned when I got into wrestling. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, when I failed in rugby, uh, that drove me to the depths really low. And, mm-hmm. and that's what, that was the first time ever I ever thought about suicide, mm-hmm. you know, and, and being in that situation, it's not good. But, uh, thankfully people around me that helped me get out of it and, um, when I got into wrestling, I started to study and and follow a lot of people who talked about failure and all mm-hmm. that and how to how to prosper from it. Yeah, and that's when I realized, man, failure is probably the best way to learn. Mm-hmm. And uh, one one thing I wish when I was still in high school, somebody told me that failing is okay mm-hmm. because everything you failed, your tests, your homework or whatever, they'll tell you you're bad, you're bad, mm-hmm. you're bad. And then that's it. You don't learn nothing. You know, I wish somebody said, 
you know, it's okay. Yeah. Let's try it again. It's okay to fail. If you failed, oh, that's okay. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. I wish I learned that back then, but now that I know, that's what I try and teach everybody. <laughs> if you fail, good. I'm glad you did. Learn from it, and how do you? What do you need to do to do, to get to the next level? Yeah. Um. Yeah. So failing in the big stage, uh, twice now, helped me get to where I am right now. And if I had not, then maybe I'll be driving a truck at. <laughs> on the road to yeah. somewhere, you know. Yeah, it, it, it's so true. It, it, it's, it's something that we're not brought up with, you know, especially, look, at if you're brought up in, if you're lucky enough and privileged enough to be brought up with parents that have a drive for you and want their child to succeed, they normally will push you to succeed. Yes. But then they won't also educate you or give you those fundamentals. Or if you don't succeed, how to manage it. Yes. Um, and... I'm I'm obviously South African. I was raised in a family that no matter what you did, you had to become the best. You played sport, you became you you, you went for national colours. You you went wow. in your education, that's how further. So I was driven, you know, I was at sixteen, I had two sports I was playing national level at. And that was a drive and that was a drive. And then, you know, come over to New Zealand, I've got two teenagers and the culture is totally different here. So uh, my wife's also not South African, she's a Kiwi. So I'm like, go, 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 go. Um, and then my wife's like, no, no, you've got to slow it down. So you've got to try and find also that middle ground because otherwise you're pushing, you're pushing a kid with a separate culture's belief and yes. process. Yes. And then if you don't give them that, uh, the mattress to fall on, mm. when they do fall over, um, they, they yes. crumple, right? Yep. And then it's not just the crumble from you, it's the expectations from the rest yes. of the culture, yes. right? Because our kids and our youth mm. is raised on, yep. they're raised around judgment at the moment. So yes. everything they do, they will either do it or don't do it because of what the judgment may or may not be because of social media, right? And, it, and it's such an interesting one where we've, we've yep. got to make sure that teaching failure up front is almost teach, is more important than teaching success. Yes. Uh, yeah, so, like you said, it's, if I had known it's okay to go to fail, I would have done everything. Yeah, and tried have, everything. I would have gone as far as I can. Maybe I'll go further than what I did before. If I if, if my coaches or my teachers will say, it's okay, go mm -hmm. do this exam. If you fail, that's okay, we can do it again. Yeah. I would have gotten in there, did the whole thing, relaxed. Instead of going in there stressing the night before, you know, not being able to, go to sleep because you're just trying to cram everything in. Yep. Then you get to the exam and then you forget everything yep. because you're so stressed out. And then you're, you're worried about failing. What are your parents going to say? What are your teachers going to say? What are your friends going to say? Yep. All that comes into play. So if I had known, so I, I like to say failure, uh, if you fail, fail forward mm -hmm. and fail your way to success. That's one of my f favorite sayings. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I mean, no, I, 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 it's it's so true around there. I mean, if you look at a guy like Eric um, Eric Thomas, the hip hop uh, the the preacher, uh, he's famous uh, right here. He took something like eight years to do a three year degree. Is one of his things, yeah. right? And one of the biggest things from that, and I can tell you, being in the business world, is mm -hmm. when when you when I meet someone and they will go, "Hey, I've got this qualification. Or I've done that." You don't go. You don't go back and go. Okay, how many times did you fail? How many times did you have to redo it? What were your marks? Yes, that's that's one of the, that's one of those weird things that like someone gets through a, and has their degree. Great, they've got a degree. We don't worry that took him three times longer. He had to do one paper four times to get through it, but we're not told this in the beginning. So you going into something going shit? I've got to hit that mark every single time, and if I stumble once. The so judge, the all. life judgment's going to be uncontrollable, and it's not it's right. Not, nope. You know, it's <laughs> there was a there's a I can't remember who said it, but there was like this this um, I saw a diagram and I saw someone talk about it. How most of us think that most of the world is judging or looking at them, and then only for us to realize that almost no one in the world is actually thinking about us. Right? Yeah. It's a it's a weird one because it's accurate and then it's also sad that no one's actually thinking about us but it's accurate in the sense that we overthink like i think oh shit what's guy thinking about me i'm i'm worried about what you're thinking about me i'm worried about what anyone else is thinking 
And then you realize that you don't give a fuck, Nobody right? Yeah. You don't truly, you look at, look at, if, if we're brothers and we're in our circle, you, you subtly give me a, you subtly yes. say, hey, dude, what's up? But otherwise, you don't give no a shit, does, right? Yeah. And, that, and that's, and that is the real world. Um, and then once you learn that, and it's funny, for years and years, I've always, I've always accepted that. And it's allowed me to, do certain things that yes. people go, hey, maybe you shouldn't do that or no. that they wouldn't do it because I'm like, it doesn't matter. If I do it, whatever they, th- and if they, if, no. if they do think, who cares, right? Yes. Yeah. What's the, what's the word? Uh, I wish I had learned that earlier, hmm. but that's our message. You know, yes. if, if you're watching this, <laughs> doesn't matter how old you are, start now. Who cares what everybody thinks? I know, I know you. I know you. I know you love talking about. You know, I know you're talking about with age and start. I know you love talking about the colonel, right? The, the colonel, <laughs> Colonel Sanders, right? Yes, yes, solid. <laughs> <laughs> I started out. Um, so I want to. I just want to bring it back to the, the moment that I ever m- saw you. Um, and it's that video we spoke about off air and stuff like that, talking about fathers and talking about dad specifically. Yes. How are they? Uh, and it's and it's called the I'm fine. I, I know it as the I'm fine video. Yes. Um, I think you did it in COVID. I think it was 2020, which after the first yeah, lockdown, which is crazy. It's almost three and a half years ago if you think about that. And I know that blew up massively for yourself. That's where yeah. I started seeing all the rest of it. Talk me through not just that moment and the rest of it, but the whole, it seems like there has been a, in the last five years, a big drive from yourself around motivation, um, helping mm-hmm. the world and, you know, just trying to go out there and say to people, it's okay. And if you need help, yes. uh, speak up and all the rest. So talk me through how, you know, I look at you, New, uh, um, New Japan pro wrestler, you're, you're larger than life, gentlemen, all the rest of it. Mm-hmm. But then, you know, no one's expecting this. this. is, again, a cultural thing. No one's expecting this massive, big person ego that goes out and performs to come down and say, hey, by the way, I'm here to help you. Because culture has made it that we, we shouldn't be soft. And you are sort of supporting and breaking that mold. Yeah, yeah. Um, you're right. Uh, it's, uh, I, I, I attribute it to when I failed on mm-hmm. the rugby mm-hmm. career and and hitting rock bottom is where I actually started to notice and start thinking of that kind of stuff. Um uh, years before I had friends who have uh, who had committed suicide because they failed in rugby and, and couldn't go back and face their families. Mm-hmm. So after their experience uh some friends of mine would uh, send me short clips of of um, uh, speakers, and mm-hmm. they're talking about some of this kind of stuff, which helped me, you know, get motivated to look at myself and start getting back into it. And the whole twenty twenty lockdown thing was the uh, driving force. They got me to start doing that kind of stuff mm-hmm. myself because there was a point where I challenged all my students to jump on TikTok, mm. and uh, my my challenge was: as a wrestler, you have to learn how to market yourself. Mm. So, in doing that, you, you also learn how to talk on camera and all that kind of stuff. And I just put those two together, yeah. you know, trying to speak learn how to speak confidently confidently in, on camera and taking the the motivational side of it and put it together and basically i was trying to do it so i can watch myself and you know try and motivate myself mm-hmm. and then uh i decided to upload some of that stuff and once i did it was it just blew up oh, you know? i went uh, massive and a lot of these videos that i put up just goes viral yeah. and what gets me is when I started doing that, I couldn't stop doing it anymore because I was getting private messages from young people, mm-hmm. a lot of teenagers talking about suicide, and and that just drove me more to do more of it. And I get it all the time, and some of these kids are at that almost going to do it, but 
I found this video. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for doing this. And and that's why I keep doing it. Mm-hmm. And and I try and watch as much as I can. Like E.T. is a good yeah. speaker to look listen to. There's a lot of people you need to listen to and, and learn from them. And you could take some of this stuff and use it. Say it in your own words and because you never know who's listening. Yep. And, you know, you, you could be talking to to kids, but then, you know, adults, some, some of the adults will take notice and think it's, you know, this is helping me. So a lot of these things, a lot of these videos that I made was, you know, started off trying to help myself, but then ended up helping a lot of people. And for me, I can't stop anymore. So that's why I just keep going, keep going. Because I get a lot of messages and they say, thank you for saving their lives. And that means a lot, man. <laughs> that feels feels like um, fulfill, feels fulfill, fulfilling. Yeah. Fulfilling. So true in that. I know we both mandate podcasts. I know uh, we've both been. Uh, so we've both been on the yes, show there. Yes. Um, so, I, so I did when I did my episode it was the first time I, that I opened up about everything about my life, about uh, my suicide, uh, suicide yes. and all the rest. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I, after my brain surgery and I financially almost went bankrupt and lost my marriage and all the rest of it, and I opened up everything on that show, did that episode, and I was like, okay. And it, as you said, it was crazy. I got I had so many people DM me after that show with the same stuff and said, hey. Mm-hmm thank you so much and all their stories and it uh, and i can totally resonate with you and going holy shit i'm not special don't get me wrong i am not fucking special at all but by me doing one thing someone else has gone hey i'm not alone or i feel the same or thank you and it just it's so true it it allows you going shit i should be doing more of it because there might be another one person that wants to hear it or another one person yes. that wants to see it, right? And um and 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 that's the the amazing way that by going out there, I mean you you a hundred times you're a hundred times bigger than I am, but it's the same thing matter. of going out and communicating mm-hmm. it and you know, trying Doesn't to change matter. the world. You, you can get free views. Yeah. That's free people who listen to your message. Yeah. Um it was it was uh it was, I lost my train of thought there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's all good, man. Yeah, so you know what's what's the next steps for yourself, right? So what's 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 th- this year, the next year around Tox and uh, New Japan? Obviously, you saw you saw sign on that side of it, but I know your big focus is now New Zealand with your yes. with your local dojo. What's what's next? Yes, uh, <clears throat> just connecting this to what we just talked about. Yeah, uh, while wrestling, I, I did get to the top level. Mm-hmm. Right, and at the time I was at the top, um, I, I a lot of people go through it uh, in a lot of different careers, but when you get to the top, you feel unfulfilled, mm-hmm. and because you've reached the top, or if you reached your goal, it's very difficult to keep yourself motivated. Mm-hmm. So I give props to guys who get there and keep that that level for so mm-hmm. many years, but. For me, when I got there, it was just, you know, what I do now. And uh, I started getting depressed a, mm. a little bit. And uh, f- listening to a lot of people and talking to a lot of mentors, they, I, I figured out that wrestling, getting to your goal is good, but you got to keep setting goals mm-hmm. uh, for yourself all the time. So when I got to the top, I realized, uh, what's my next step? Start a school. So when I started the school, there was a big challenge. Mm -hmm. And uh, finally got to a stage where New Japan made it part of New Japan. And when that happened, uh, same situation happened. What do I do now? And uh, the next step was promotion. Mm -hmm. So open up uh, New Japan Tamashi. Mm -hmm. So that's what we've been doing with... um, New Japan the last year is developing the New Japan Tamashi brand in New Zealand and Australia. And this year, the next level is uh, doing tours. Mm-hmm. So we're going to start doing tours all over uh, all over Oceania. Mm-hmm. And we're talking to the islands, Fiji, Samoa, and Tonga, and hopefully Hawaii as well. But we're going to try and do tours all around there and Australia also in New Zealand. But um, overall, once I get that all set mm-hmm. and and going, 
my ultimate goal. And like I said, I get a lot of fulfillment and I feel like my, my purpose in life is to help people. Mm -hmm. So once I get this running, uh, that could be what helps me get out and help more people where my ultimate ultimate um, goal is to be a life coach. Yeah. Uh, still be part of the wrestling business as a promoter mm -hmm. uh, and wrestle here and there, but I want to get out there and do what fulfills my heart and that's helping people um, just by talking to them, you know, and mm -hmm. listening and that kind of stuff uh, makes me happy. It's amazing, so, man. Um, it's so true. And like, we're going back to it, like when you reach the top of your mountain, there's always a famous saying that the top of the mountain is very lonely because you're normally by yourself. Yes, it is. And one of the other mo more famous people um, that you might know in the, in the last couple of years that went to the same issue was Tyson Fury. Tyson Fury went and won the boxing heavyweight champion, one of the greatest boxers of all time, won everything. And he went off the radar for 12 months or so. They couldn't find him. He, he's the gypsy king. He went and back to the gypsies and um, – almost committed suicide because he had that same thing. He got to the top and he said, what's what's the rest, what's the purpose of my life? Yes. I've achieved everything. Why should I still be around? And and we do see that in, in our culture today. And, if, and it's true that if we don't show or teach people that, hey, by the way, that is your goal, but that is a goal, not yes. the goal. Yeah. Um, and then get there and then learn what to, and pivot and then what the next step goes on and goes yes. on because otherwise you do get to the top of that mountain. Mm -hmm. um, and that was also a bit of an underlying part of when when um, I got to, um, suicidal thoughts and all the rest of it through mm -hmm. my surgery was, was the previous year I was on top of the mountain. I achieved everything I ever wanted and traveled with the world and all this, hey, look at me, I'm great, you know, sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then you fall and then I fell off that and then you had no idea how to control it or where to go. Yes, yes. It's tough. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard for me to see like a lot of my students come through and – and it's hard for me to see them and talk to them and they say, oh, I want to get to the top. I want to get to the top. And I do want to help them get there. Yeah. But I, I, I warn them. I said, you're going to get there and you're gonna, not going to like it. Yeah. Sometimes Some people do, some people don't. Mm -hmm. And I got there and I was very unhappy. <laughs> I was not fulfilled. And I remember I told some of the wrestlers that I was working with and they didn't understand what I was going through because yeah. they, they hadn't reached it yet. Yeah. But it was tough and it kind of, it did get lonely because they didn't see what I was seeing. Mm -hmm. And so I had to separate myself because it was very tough trying to talk to them and, and yeah, it's, it's you got to figure it out. Uh, there's also that saying, you know, you got to stay hungry when you're on top, yeah. you know, because you have that saying, uh, the, the wolf, on top of the mountain is not as hungry as the wolf climbing the mountain, the mountain yeah. because, you know, you're going to be up there and you're fat. <laughs> and you're just relaxing and yeah. the hungry wolf's going to come and eat you. So. <laughs> yeah. That's so true on that one. Um, last thing I just wanted to get through today, Tox, is uh, talk me through this. Um, what's this new thing I see on social media with your uh, – is a cover stand or something that you got going on at the moment? Obviously, the last couple of weeks, I see you got a, you got a lot of your guys. Your videos are great. You got a lot of the boys out of the dojo doing some videos with you and stuff like that. So, what's going on there? A little backstory on that: um, Kava is the Tongan traditional drink, and they use this drink for socializing, mm -hmm. uh, mostly male, but recently a lot of women are getting into it. But a lot of the Tongans will get get together every Friday night, every Saturday night, and just sit around and talk about work and politics and sports and all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. Um, but I was never a big fan of it. For years, uh, my family or my dad would try to get me into it, but I was never a big fan of it because uh, I love my alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> but until last year, I went to Hawaii, and I was there for two weeks. And every single night, I was at the nightclub or the bar, mm. But my nephew would always say, let's go to a cover bar. Let's go to a cover bar. And I said, no, no, no. Until the last night, mm -hmm. I finally said, okay, I'll come along. Went along, tried the cover, sat there and just realized it was just a chill mm. atmosphere. Everybody's just there to relax and chill. And cover's not an alcoholic drink. It's yeah. a it's a root. I'd say maybe it's a drug that you can drink. Mm -hmm. 
but it's a legal <laughs> non-alcoholic al- alcoholic drink. Yeah. And when I tried it, I just my mind was blown because mm. I came back from Hawaii the next day and I had decided I'm going to open one of these bars. Yeah. So I, I opened one down in Huntley and mm. I've got a a cover bar um catered to pretty much anyone, not just the Tongans or the mm. Fijians or the Islanders, but uh, anyone who can try it. And what we did, <laughs> what I did was, uh, I thought, how do I market this? Yeah. So utilizing our platforms, mm. uh, uh, TikTok, we made a video uh, a week ago and actually didn't expect it, but yeah. this video almost, it's almost hitting 7 million views. Yeah. And right. I think, I think it's going to keep going, mm-hmm. but people were so interested in what it was and they want to try it and all that. But yeah, that's a cover. Uh, it's a relaxant. Mm. And one day you you can come in there. Yeah, man. We'll have totally. some in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's what it is. Oh, amazing. That's what I'm, one of the side projects I'm working on. That's awesome, man. Oh, yeah, totally. I'll, I'll take it. I'll take you on that bed, and we can have a sit there, and we'll go. We can we can have one day there, and then one day we can go to the bar. Okay, I'm in South Africa. I've got. I've got to keep. I've got to. I've got to keep up my might pops. Change your mind because <laughs> I haven't had any alcohol in a long time. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, since no. last night. Was <laughs> That's a long time. Yeah, you haven't had it in about twelve hours. So you know, you're, you're a bit dry at the moment. <laughs> Uh, Tox, as we're coming up to the, uh, the end for today, is there anything for the audience, anything you want to leave them with or thoughts or anything you want to say? The main thing I would like to tell everyone is you are going to come uh, to full stops in whatever you're trying to do. So there's a saying that I, I, I really like, and it goes, when you hit a door and when you hit a closed door, don't feel like that's the end of it. If the door's closed, look for the window because there will always be a window. It's amazing. I love it. And Tox, I thank you for the opportunity and coming on the show and, you know, sharing your wisdom. And like I said, it, to me, it's a really surreal moment that uh, three years ago I saw someone um, online and I was like, holy shit, you're amazing. <laughs> and three years later, you sit across the table from me and we would have a, a chat and everything else. And now, in, in, a, in a weird way, um, our lives are so, going to slowly come together, like with my son and the wrestling. So we'll be running into each other yep. Um, yep. E- every few days. I don't know if you're coming down on Sunday. I know your boys yep. are wrestling on Sunday. You're yep. coming on Sunday to you? Maybe, maybe. Maybe. So I might even yeah. see you again in a few <laughs> days' time. Um, so, yeah, but it's awesome. Um, thanks so much for that. Thanks, talks. Lawrence. All good, man. Um, and as always, to everyone else that comes over to the show, thanks for joining us today. As I always say at the end of my show, I don't care about saying subscribe and share and like and all the other stuff. What I care about is if there's something today that resonates with you, is just take a listen of that one. If there's something today that you think someone needs to hear to help their lives, improve their lives, or maybe just to help nudge and put them in the right track, I don't care how you do it. Get them, confuse them. Tell them, that, hey, this is the funniest podcast you've ever seen. Share it to them and make them watch it because we need to help each other more. We don't need to get famous more. We need to help each other more. But as always, thanks for coming over to the show and hope to see you again.